Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the next edition of the Players NIL Podcast and the NIL Playbook. My special guest today, Henry J. Bell. Henry, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. You know, I've had uh, a lot of fortunate uh, things happen to me since I started this company. And probably the greatest thing is I get to meet people that I've never met before. Mm-hmm. People with experience, people with wisdom, people with ex- with a, a mission to help other athletes. And Henry, I want to definitely get into the work that you're doing um, and how you're trying to accomplish that in this new crazy world. But before we get Absolutely. there, our mission statement is, you know, how can we use athletics to better our lives? So I want to go back to your childhood and I use two words, right? One is sports and one is athletics. To me, sports is the fandom part. Athletics is the participation mm-hmm. part. For most people, okay, okay. the fandom part started first. You went to a game, you saw, saw something on television, your dad, your grandpa, your, maybe it was your grandma brought you to a game. Tell us about mm-hmm. your first earliest memories of sports, maybe some of the heroes that you saw. Give us some insights. So insight, I grew up in the uh, mid-city of Los Angeles, right in the heart of the city. Um, and our street was very unique. I think we, at growing up, I think we grew up with, I mean, just on my block alone, about 17 boys, and I just, top of my head. And I was introduced to sports all the, because all the games that we played in the middle of the street, all right, all the things that, you know, just playing football, playing throw up tackle, and just throwing all these diff- different things in the middle of our street, uh, breaking people. <laughs> side mirrors and and always you know I run into trees and all that stuff and that's really was like my first introduction to sports it just it, it, honestly like I really can't even pinpoint a time where it's like oh I love sports now it was just kind of like what we did in our neighborhood as a kid from my older brother I'm the youngest in my family um so each uh my brother was three years older than me and my oldest brother is three years older than my oldest brother so there was kind of that level of of friends that grew up in our neighborhood and my brother, oldest brother had his, his group of friends. My middle brother has a group of friends. And I had my group of friends. But we all kind of was in that same network of, you know, hanging out and, and playing games and, and things of that nature. So I never really was, like, introduced to sports. It was just like, this is what we did. You know, we rode our bikes. We, yeah, I, I was always laugh because I don't remember the time I ever was taught how to ride a bike. I just felt like I just picked up the bike and started riding it just because everybody else was doing it. <laughs> so, um, and so we always just played sports. I mean, even in our backyard, we'll have, I don't know, half the neighborhood in our backyard just playing basketball. Uh, and, you know, so just, I just fell in love with this, with the game, uh, with all sport, with all, all from basketball, football, uh, even baseball, we just did it all. And that's where I fell in love with it. And then start playing pop board and football and a whole new group of friends that I still have friends with to this day. And that's really was my introduction to sports. I love it. It's the great American way. You know, though some of those games could be very competitive in the backyard, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, we still have, we still talk about different plays that was called that was unstoppable. And I mean, it just, we have a play called the cornbread play. One of my, my, my cousin, Keno, uh, he drew this play up one time. And I think we had all to be, I guess, in the age of between maybe 12 to seven years old. And we drew up his play, and it always scored every time. And we always still to this day laugh about it, the cornbread play. <laughs> but that, yeah, it, it, that's that's the the neighborhood. I mean, I, my I I don't want to say my neighborhood was very unique to other neighborhoods, but um, I never I haven't come across anybody who had um, that type of uh, neighborhood where we're middle of the city, and all we do outside is just play, 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 play. And that's you know that's what we did. Yeah, well, seventeen yeah. boys will make it competitive, so. So you're you oh, fall in love with you fall in love with sports. You you friends with all the neighbors. You're competing. When did you know that? Now you're an athlete. Uh, maybe I'm a half a step faster than that guy. I can jump a little higher than that dude. Like when was it that? Uh, went, oh man, I think I could do something here. Yeah, you you know what? That's funny. I I think it's uh I got I caught the Jordan bug. I mean, I think anybody in my age. Yeah, I'm I'm forty five forty six now, and so anybody in my age range who grew up and you know, saw that 1988 dunk contest. And next thing you know, everybody in my age bracket was trying to dunk like Jordan. And I, I honestly, like I, I put a lot of work in as a young kid and really didn't realize what I was doing, but I just wanted to jump higher. And so I would, 
set up. Uh, we used to have a little picnic table in the backyard. And that was, I didn't know what plyometrics were, but I was doing plyometrics at 12 years old, 10, year, 10, 10 to 12 years old. I was jumping in the, on and off the, the bench in the backyard. So, um, and I was able to increase my jumping ability. I was able to get faster and all these things that I didn't know I was doing. I just wanted to be Michael Jordan. And, um, and that was like, wow, okay, well, I just dunked on this guy. I didn't know I can do that, but all right, <laughs> I just outran this kid, you know? And so I was like, oh, I think I have, a, have something here. And then obviously you have your coaches that tell you, you know, they start to see something in you and, and they start to pick you up and, and start to make sure that you come to practice and, and do all the things you need to do to be successful. So I did have that and your friends as well, you know? And so, um, yeah, it was probably around, I want to say 12, 13, where I really knew that I, I this was what I wanted to do. And I, I felt like I was, I had the athletic ability to, to do it. Well, it was more than a commercial be like Mike, right? It was a, it was a, it was oh, a nation, <laughs> nationwide phenomenon, right? Everybody wanted it to It was be a like phenomenon. Mike. Yeah, yeah. I ate Wheaties I have, every I ate Wheaties every Saturday morning for for a basketball game, and, and I, to this day I would not touch Wheaties. But you put well, Michael Jordan on the cover back then, I'm eating Wheaties. <laughs> well, my my favorite movie, Full Confession, is White Men Can't Jump. If you get what I mean. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I that to me that's a myth because I had a bunch of my my boys. I went to Montclair Prep High School and I had a bunch of my boys, man, who could jump out the gym. All white guys, so that so the, it's a little myth. It's a myth. Maybe a few was, handful of white guys can't jump, but there's a few that can do it. Uh, for me, it was for me, it was reality. It wasn't a myth. So, um, <laughs> hey, don't don't so, don't take it wrong, man. I said also, I saw some of my brother that can't jump a leg. Can't put a what they said they can't put a car <laughs> under their feet. Yeah, so some of my good friends or brothers that just can't jump at all. So it's not just a white guy. <laughs> so you have this passion for sports. You realize you're talented. Tell us quickly about your athletic journey and how it created opportunities for you. You know, um, went to Montclair Prep. Uh, I had an opportunity. Actually, I went to a private, a public school first, Hamilton High School. I'm sure you probably know the school being from uh, Southern California, but Hamilton High School was the school I was attending. Uh, and then I, one of my good friends, he had a cousin who played basketball at a private school at Montclair Prep. We all went to do a pickup game, and and I got introduced to a gentleman by Mr. name, Mr. Jones. And Mr. Jones thought that, hey, you guys should come to the school. It was pretty much illegal recruiting <laughs> when you really think about it. But um, but he gave us an opportunity. He gave us an opportunity to get us out of the inner city, and you know, uh, put us into a, a private school setting that uh, had kids. I think we I graduated a class of ninety, and all ninety went to, went to college. And so being in that environment just, just opened my eyes and, and that the, the athletic world was a possibility because this school was, was, you know, the tradition of the school was all about, you know, athletics and, and athletic success. We want to see IF championship, things of that nature. And, um, and so from there, and it's in my book as well, I didn't really, like, early on, I didn't grasp academics and athletics was always the, 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 the go-to, right? academics was always second or third nature so I struggled my senior year didn't didn't pass my SAT so I didn't have to go to a during college and which was actually a better a good thing for me in hindsight because I was able to develop I was able to um, understand my role and understand the importance of academics and so once I took took it serious then I had a good two couple years uh, at during college and then I got a scholarship at Purdue and so uh, it, it was just a journey. It was just one of those things where you had a lot of heartache, a lot of success, but uh, a lot of heartache because the recruiting process was was challenging for me because all the things I didn't do early on in my in my career from ninth, tenth grade, I just I didn't handle business. So um, and then not passing my SATs, all those things were kind of my. It, it, it just it just is just some setbacks and some very 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 heavy disappointments that I had to take on and had to figure out how to get over. And, uh, and overcome, and I did. And uh, and so I ended up going to Purdue, had a good career there. Uh, and again, I got sidetracked, didn't get safe focused, and then graduate. And so that's kind of led me into my you know life after college, where it's like, okay, everything I, I went through, everything, all the struggles, how do I give back? And that's where I started creating my program called B2G Sports. So the second motto of our company is how do you use athletics to better the lives of the people around right. you? For 20 plus years, you've put on high school camps, you've managed high school athletes personally, professionally, their families, you've guided them. 
tell us a little bit about your work and how the game plan, the book came about. So um, the work we did was life, life, I mean, game changing and really for the industry within, within whole, uh, because right now, I mean, if you look around everything that we created back in 2000, they're currently, people are currently doing it still. Um, uh, our elite camp was the first of its kind. Uh, in football, I'm pretty sure if you just, just think back back into the you know, 90s, early 2000s, um, football really was football camps, I should say, was really geared to the masses. Um, so you had, you know, four or five hundred kid camps. It was more of a money grab. I, I always thought it was more of a money grab uh, out of that four or five hundred kids. Maybe there might be t- 10 to t- maybe 10 to 15. that might be elite kids, uh, but they're getting overshadowed because there's so many kids out there. So I saw that there was a void. And in, in the game and with having a basketball background, uh, I always wanted to be I always, always admired Sonny Vaccaro. Didn't necessarily want to be him, but I always admired Sonny Vaccaro and what he did with the ABCD basketball camps and all those elite camps that he put on back in the day uh, where, you know, if you got invited, you're getting hands on coaching from some of the best coaches in the, in the game. And it's only a handful of guys that are, that are there. So that's where you found the LeBron James, where you found the Kobe Bryant, where you found the, the Michael Jordans. So early 2000s, there was nothing like that in football. Um, you know, the only thing that was really close to that was the the Nike Combine, but it was a combine. It wasn't a camp. It wasn't. You wasn't getting instruction. You wasn't getting you know coached up. You were there for four hours running drills. And again, it's, it's three four hundred athletes that are there. It might be elite, but you know, there's no instruction. There's no hands on. Um, and I always <clears> felt that that benefited the organizers more than the actual kids. Uh, because the kids are just testing. <laughs> and so uh, so we created the, the B2G Elite Camp, which was a model of the, NC, uh, the uh, ABC basketball camp. And that was the first of its kind in football. And so uh, early on, our goal was 65. The first camp we did, we only had nine kids. <laughs> but we knew that the format that we created, um, it was really geared to giving football players what to expect their first year of college. So as a football guy, I'm sure you remember uh, rookie camp before all the veterans show up. It's just the, the freshmen come in, they're there for a couple of days and they kind of get that introduction and they're out there on the field, throwing around, whatever, but they have in the classroom stuff about, okay, what to prepare for your first semester of college. So that's what we modeled. So we took the Sunny Vaccaro model of, of, of just invitation only, small group, no more than 65. And then we took the the model of, of um, you know, uh, the first freshman freshman ball, basically. So the first first few days of a fall camp and we get that into a camp. And so the practices were identical to what you will get at a college camp, uh, our college fall camp. And we also had at night, you know, the business side of what to expect. So we had guest speakers come in from as Marcellus Wiley to uh, 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 Paul Tannebaum to um, – uh, Ramogi Huma, you know, a lot, a lot of the, the big players at the time, and they will come in and talk to the kids about the in and outs. Uh, and so that's what we built. We built that foundation. Eventually, caught uh, it caught win to the nation in 2016, 2006, when Nike, we were the partner with Nike, and uh, and they did an internal video. And basically, what they wanted to see was, you know, what we we're doing. And so they, they filmed this internal video that, that was just for their their department. And they allow us to have a copy of it and we put it on YouTube and it went viral. Mm. And so I think in the first two weeks, uh, we had like maybe 2 million views and Nike pulled it down. <laughs> Nike made us pull it down. We put it back up though. It's back up. And I think still is like almost 300,000 views on it. And, uh, and so when Nike put it back up, I mean, took it down. And the reason why they took it down because it was basically for their internal use. They didn't want it to get out. And so um, that was the birth of everything that you see today, because now you see seven on seven club tournaments. And that was because of what we did. Um, our last day of, of the camp was called the A game. And we made it into an event. It was just for a way the kids to to get information about or not information, I should say, is a way for kids to to earn their last awards. Right. So after three days, three nights, the last day of the camp was the A game, which was a seven on seven competition we put on flags things of that nature and they just running around i'll send you the video so you can see it uh but they're running around and you know kids grab flags and it's 707 it's just we always did 707 in, 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 in every practice just like you know you would as a football camp i mean at an actual football practice and so 
we may end up branding that to be the A game. And we started inviting people out to come see it because it was exciting. It was a nice time. Kids were doing highlight stuff. And, and so that video got out. That's what Nike took internally. And we posted it and they didn't like that. So they ended up pulling it down. <laughs> and so um, that was the birth of 707 football and also the birth of what Nike eventually did a few years later, the Nike opening. And so they basically took our model and created the Nike opening. But you also had a birth of, from 2008 on, you had a birth of elite camps popping up and obviously a lot of 707 programs popping up from that point on. So, yeah, yeah so that's so that's been... You know, a lot of what we was able to do and, and for the culture, for the industry. And, uh, you know, we still was working with kids and trying to make sure that they know, understand the business side of sports. You know, it's one thing that these coaches recruit you and, and they dating you. But once you get on campus, all those things change. And now it's about the business. So what does that look like? And that's what we yeah. share. And that's what the, where the book, the game plan eventually came from. Well, I love it. You know, it's a it's a way to, to help young athletes and their families. Uh, in theory, that the Absolutely. parents and their supporters and their 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 fellow citizens in their community are paying attention to what's going on, and it's a great way to advance a kid's opportunities using athletics. So, name, image, and likeness has been around forever. You go back to the, yes. the Gatorade commercial and be like Mike. I mean, that is an example of name, image, right. and likeness for professional athletes. But you know, now it's available in twenty five states high school level and nationwide at the college level if you're henry bell and you're a junior in high school and you could talk to yourself you know given the name image and likeness opportunities give me a couple bullet points what would you tell henry age 17 to pay attention to be careful of to do to not do give us give us a couple of nuggets of wisdom looking back at the henry Bell today uh you know you gotta understand what a brand means, right? Uh, I think for a young young Henry, I need to, he he needs to know what 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 it means to have a brand, and that's um, people knowing who you are without you being in a room, right? So first and foremost, what does that mean? As well, it's your character, it's what you do, it's how you carry yourself, how you carry yourself on the field. Um, a lot of things people put a lot of weight on the on field play, which is very important, which is um, key to that but also what you do off the field. So I would tell my younger self um, to get involved with your community, get involved with doing extra things that will make your brand stronger. So when people connect with you, they're connecting with someone who they know has a strong name in their in their respective community because of the work they've done. Uh, and again, that could be whatever your passion is, whatever you love to do. It could be working with the kids at the YMCA. It could be working with, um, you know, after school programs or whatever the case may be, just find your find that program uh, or create your own. You know, if you have a parent that, that can help you create your own. I think um, community involvement is uh, is on par with success of a, of a brand uh, for student athletes. And then obviously uh, on field play and on your on a field play, uh, you, you got to you can't cheat the game. You can't teach again. You got to be on point. You got to show up. You got to work hard. You can't cut drills. You can't. You can't do the things that is going to minimize your opportunity to be successful. Uh, and so you put those. You combine on the field and off the field, and obviously academics. Academics is also part of that. Um, so really, those are my three 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 tiers of of things that to really build your brand uh, as a student athlete. If you're in eleventh grade, is one again community involvement to academics oh, let me say well one academics <laughs> let's start there one academics two on the field play because obviously you can't be you won't have the nil opportunities if you're not successful on the field so let's let's make sure that's that's there and then three your community involvement so i think those are the three pillars uh, of success of how to create a successful brand i love it you go from high school athlete junior college college athlete innovator in this space, leader in this space, now author, the game plan. Where can people learn more about you? Where can they buy your book? This is your chance to plug all of your uh, social and online Yes, yes, assets. yes. Uh, I, I appreciate that. So you can uh, grab a copy of the book, The Game Plan, here. You can you can pick it up at, let me see, there you go. You can pick it up uh, at my website at henryjbell.com. Uh, again, henryjbell.com, and my in- Instagram is uh, henbeezy, H-E-N-B-E-E-Z-Y. 
Uh, and that's also my Twitter, uh, H-E-N-B-E-E-Z-Y. And uh, yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Uh, any questions about the book, Richard Sherman, uh, I was fortunate enough to have Richard Sherman do the forward. Uh, Richard Sherman played, well not played, but he uh, attended my program from a freshman all the way through uh, really the pro draft. Uh, we do have my, my partner uh, at the time helped with the pro draft training for Richard. So he's been with us uh, really throughout the, the process. So he was able to get in, give his insight on his experience um, of, of what we were able to put together and, and what he saw and uh, and how it benefited him as well. And so you definitely want to be able to check it out because you're getting a Super Bowl champ giving you real good insight about that as well. So, um, but yeah, that's it. That's it. I got a few things under my, uh, you know, but between, uh, but in my sleeve that I'm going to be pulling out pretty soon. I will definitely keep you posted on that. And, uh, but for right now, just go to my website. You can pick up the book there. Uh, if you can't, for some reason, go to my website, you can always go to amazon.com. Often, uh, I tell people that I'm proud of them for the work that they do in their community and giving back. And I will say the same thing to you, Henry. I'm proud for you, for your Thank wisdom, you. knowledge, and for your, your humility to say, hey, these are the things I've learned. Let's see if we can have someone that benefits from my experience and my wisdom. So congratulations to all of that. And, and I salute you for that. I appreciate it, Mark. And I appreciate the opportunity to come on your, on your, 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 your podcast and have an opportunity to talk about what, what I do on this, on this platform. So I really, really do appreciate you reaching out to me and re me reaching out to you and you responding, I should say. <laughs> all boats rise, my friend. We're all trying to learn and we're all trying to do the same thing and that's help young athletes. So, Thank you for being my guest today. Absolutely. I appreciate your time. Thank you.